Not true. Okay, so um, to to you know to to get to this part, right? So this is going to be part of a larger uh, article. Um, poets and writers, uh, uh, fifty and forward. Is that like is this, is there like fiftieth year anniversary? Um, this is an article from uh, twenty fifteen, right? January twenty fifteen. The art of reading, John Barryman. Waking up in the dream songs. There's like you know some historical stuff, cultural stuff, um, biographical sketches. Um, I'm not so interested in this article. Uh, I'm more interested uh, in a part of this article, like when we start going into like the the same kind of like uh, blackface stuff um, that we've been discussing, right? Because this has been, you know, the, the most controversial part of John Berriman, right? Um, you know, like if you're gonna choose something to get mad about, you're gonna say, you know, he 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 put on uh, minstrelsy, right? Like, like th- th- this is this is what he was about. Like, you're gonna say that. Like, you can't. You you're not gonna avoid that. I, I don't think you will. Um, uh, like, if you want something to get fucking mad about, and people always do, like th- this is where you're gonna talk about. So, like, it's not unexpected. And here's the thing: like, you shouldn't get mad at having to like rebut stuff like this or to to deal with it in some way. Because I mean, look, um, you know, you know where I stand politically, but uh, you know, the person writing this, I'm sure, is a nice liberal and has good liberal, you know, feelings and does not want to see racism and does not want to see like basic ass, like you know, uh, blackface shows, right? This person's gonna say like, this is bad, like we we should culturally be beyond that, and all that's true and all that's fine, right? Um, so if we have a kind of typical, you know, academically sort of oriented person, artistically oriented person, you know, uh, uh, in a gig like writing for poets and writers, not to say that that's like, you know, you have it made there, but, you know, it's something. The profile of that person, I would imagine, would be the person that doesn't care about the Tyson Foods catastrophe, uh, uh, but would in fact probably care and talk about and write about something like this okay and by the way I, I don't mean this personally against this person writing this right i don't mean to say that jay baron nicorvo you know believes bad things or that he's like careless or that he's somehow you know whatever i i i'm just saying that um you know uh, as a representation culturally of like you getting mad at something in this writing like knowing in the cultural moment that we're in you know the, the the blackface stuff uh, is, is going to be the thing that you, that you focus on, right? So let's not get mad at that. Let's not say, oh my God, this is so fucking beneath us. Let's actually meet the argument, right? Um, and I think I've already met some of the argument already, but let's meet the argument. Let, let, let's talk about it. Let's not lose our fucking heads. Let's not be as reactive as this article is, okay? Okay. Um, you don't have to be that reactive. So let's let, let's go through this. The dream songs can't be considered in the dark. To overlook Berryman's use of minstrelsy, of the tropes of blackface and black dialect, is to perpetrate an offensive ignorance. For succinct, thorough, and exacting assessment of uh, minstrelsy in the dream songs and the crucial critical critical writing concerning it, read Peter Maber's essay, So-Called Black. So we're not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to read... Um, the abstract from this thing. Um, and after we read the abstract, we are going to uh, like, and also like, you know, the arguments from here, I'm sure get like sort of paraphrase in this article. So uh, I, I, I assume that, you know, hopefully not unfairly that rebutting one to some degree will be rebutting to some degree uh, of the other, uh, even if we can't read this entire article. So um, hopefully we could get away with that and not commit uh, too bad of an intellectual offense. Um, Berryman deservedly gets a bad rap these days. Okay, so we get you know a, a value judgment here, right? Um, and it's a value judgment, by the way, that uh, kind of bleeds a little bit over into, you know, um, you know. Let's be real, like into the poetry. We're not just talking about Berryman the man. Like I don't know 
per like personally he definitely seems misogynistic uh I, I don't know what he felt about race relations um uh in 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 the 60s and 70s um uh but you know th- this is not being applied just to Behrman himself this is you know the, the the racism like the 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 blackface like that that's clearly also referring um in some way to the poems right so let's just remember that and he surely was those things if you hold him to our present day standards. But the beauty of Barrowman, and by the way, I mean this 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 would be literally true of like almost every white man in the sixties, right? Uh, every white man in the sixties in America was probably racist uh, compared to our present day standards, right? Let's not we're not gonna like be delusional about that, um, right? That this is why like moral thinking and moral progress exists, um, even if like functionally it doesn't seem to add up to much, like. Let's just remember that this is true, right? Even like interpersonal day-to-day interactions, like who could you date? Who could you date today versus 40 years ago? Dan says all the time, like, you know, he wish he could have dated um, uh, uh, more broadly because like back then if he would date like, you know, some of the black girls that, that he was interested in, um, he'd be like fucking like harassed and run out of his neighborhood, uh, and would have to deal with, well, not that he probably would have, he probably would have responded appropriately, but he would have been fucking harassed. Let's, let's put that at a minimum. Um, whereas like, you know, when I was growing up and, uh, uh dating, um, just like, you know, just literally, literally like, uh, 20, 30 years later, um, uh, I, I, I've never felt, uh, unwanted or that I couldn't, or that it would be bad for me in some way, or that I would be harassed. Like, um, so like, just, just let, let's keep that in mind, right. Uh, by our, you know, present day standards, like this, this has to by necessity apply to virtually almost everyone. It would be a very rare person indeed where to whom this would not apply, but the beauty of Berryman, his humanity and wisdom, even is that he actively wrestles with his misogyny, his racism. Uh, this is true. But again, I, I cannot vouch for this just like I can't, I don't want to say like, oh, we're going to debunk this, this fucking article. Like I can't say that cause we, I haven't read it, right. We're just doing the abstract. Um, I don't want to say here that he wrestles with his racism because I don't know enough about Berman's personal life to, to say that personally. I, I just have the blackface in the poems, which, you know, maybe this author is conflating also with racism in general, which I'm not, right? So it, it, I, I, you know, I don't want to unfairly like put words into the, this uh, guy's mouth, but um, I am, you know, I, I am not uh, conflating Berryman's use of blackface characters with racism in Berryman the man, right? But maybe this conflation is being made in the article. Um, Berryman risks ridicule and public shame in running face first into the history of minstrelsy that is inherent, that is abhorrent in this country. The minstrel show is considered America's first distinct cultural contribution to the dramatic arts. Berryman gave voice to a minstrel, only friends to Henry, whom he saw at least in part as death and blackface speaking in black vernacular um well i mean uh e- even if we're like going by biographical sketches i mean Berman said this exact opposite Berman said that mr bones is supposed to um uh represent death right and mr bones is the henry character um so you know, uh, maybe has some evidence for something in a poem that would indicate that uh, 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 the the blackface friend to Henry is death in blackface. But I, I haven't seen that in the poems themselves and definitely not by Berman's own statements, right? Th- this, this thing, this death figure, this thing is already present according to Berman. Read this way, the dream songs is a dialectic with death. Henry and death soft shooing around each other, but identity in the dream songs as in life is never that plain. There are times in the poems when Henry, death, Mr. Bones, John Berryman, and John Smith, both of them, the father and the son, all merge. Death, the minstrel, the poet, they're not other. They're part of the self. That is a saving grace. That's what keeps dream songs and Berryman from bigotry. There is a black minstrel in all of us Americans, Berryman seems to be saying, those who refuse or repress this aspect of the American self are the most likely to act out of bigotry. Well, I guess that part is true. In this way, Barryman confronts one of the most difficult concerns facing the American writer. To write honestly about America, you must write about racism. Now, um, 
this is like a total fucking overcompensation. Like, you know that one of your favorite posts, which I assume to, I don't want to keep saying this guy. It's kind of rude. Uh, J. Baron Nikorvo. Okay, so let's just say Nikorvo. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Um, uh, let's assume that, you know, uh, Barryman is one of Nikor's, Nikorvo's favorite writers. And, you know, he's also, let's assume, a good liberal does not want to feel racist that he's like consuming racist poetry. So um, on the one hand, you want to sort of call out the blackface to, you know, remain in the good graces of liberalism. But then on the other hand, uh, you sort of want to, you know, justify Barryman because you love Barryman by saying that um, this is like forcing you to wrestle with racism. But, you know, honestly, um, uh, I don't see much wrestle, wrestling with racism itself or sexism for that matter. I just don't. Um, uh, to the extent that the character that keeps calling Henry Mr. Bones exists and to the extent that to the extent that he is chronically in blackface, um, uh, I just view that as, you know, uh, an unconventional character, you know, uh, being used, you know, like from the minstrel tradition, uh, possibly, but also like, you know, he's not, he's not a, like, I, I can't say that he's a minstrel character. I, I can't, I'm not comfortable just like assuming that that's what's happening because yeah, like he, he speak, the character speaking in a fucking like, I guess like generic, like black dialect, perhaps as like over managed, imagined by a white person in the sixties, fine. But he's, 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 he's not a fucking like, he, he's not truly in blackface in that way, right? I mean, something else is going on. Like, we went over the specifics of the poems. This is a wise character that keeps saying, Mr. Bones, Mr. Bones. This is a Mr. Bones. Th- this is a character that is pushing the buttons of this so-called Mr. Bones. He keeps getting poetry out of him. And oftentimes, he himself, the blackface character, is given such poetry. This never fucking existed in minstrel shows. They had one purpose only. That purpose was to, you know, provide like cheap entertainment to white people at the expense of black people through stereotypes, right? That was it. Is that honestly what's going on in the dream songs that we read? Because I don't see that, right? So to overcompensate for what is actually going on in reality, like it, it, like like line by line in the poems by saying like, He's forcing you to confront racism. That's just not true. May, may, maybe in a very kind of small sense, in a kind of like we are all interacting interpersonally. I'm gonna make this into a wise man instead of like a a a a, a, a black face kind of like clown. Maybe to that degree, it's a comment on racism. But I mean, it, you know, is you know, like like when when uh um. Uh, uh, when uh, Ben Gazzara's uh, character uh, stands at the end of Killing a Chinese Bookie and he's like delivering a speech and he's been shot, you know, later on you, you see that he's, that he's actually bleeding out of the side of his um, uh, jacket and he's like putting ice in there to sort of make himself feel better and we don't know whether he's going to die or not. Uh, he's sort of like standing, um, you know, people are like demanding the show. He, the show girls are supposed to come out, and they haven't been out yet. And he comes out, and he, you know, he he buys everyone a drink, and he says, like, listen, uh, we had a problem tonight. Um, you know, uh, one of the girls left, Rachel. Uh, uh, Rachel, she was a black girl. Uh, she was black and beautiful, and I loved her, and I drink to her. Right? I think I think uh, verbatim. Right? That was. Um, what he said. I mean, in the 70s, that's also kind of radical to say for a white man, especially of his age um, in, in the 70s, right? That was a radical thing to say. Is that a comment on racism? Well, I guess you could say that in a small sense, but there's a lot more going on than just racism, right? Uh, the, the fact that she is, you know, a, a black dancer uh, in the movie that, that definitely works on, you know, uh, interesting levels, just like having a black face or like minstrel type character, I guess, uh, makes it work on additional uh, layers. But to, to, to write a line like this, like in this way, Barryman confronts one of the most difficult concerns facing the American writer to write honestly about America. You must write about racism. 
Th this is a liberal overcompensation for things that you want to be true and for things that you believe in. I'm not saying this is like the wrong knee-jerk reaction. I'm not saying that that's like bad in some way. I'm not saying that it's even an example of bad liberalism, but it's like pretty generic liberalism and it's fairly hollow and empty cultural and artistic critique. Sorry. Add to this the countless anecdotes about Behrman's womanizing, ass-smacking ways. Uh, uh, say the night he, in the company of Philip Levine, twice reached up his hand up the dress of Franny, Levine's wife. Levine busted Behrman's lip for it. But there's also the book-length poem that broke Behrman through homage to Mrs. Bradstreet, a heroically empathetic exploration of the life of Anne Bradstreet, deemed the first published poet and first published female writer in the British North American colonies. Behrman championed women. Behrman abused women. Behrman wrestled racism. Some would say he lost, but he tried. Um, so this thing about women, like I, I do find that an interesting kind of psychological observation only in the sense that, I mean, listen, like if you're an artist and if in any way, uh, you are guilt racked and you know, you feel like you're broken in some way and you want redemption, you're going to use writing as, as a mode of redemption. You will. And if you're, you know, uh, uh, pretty, you know, fucked up towards women in your personal life, you might say, I want to now champion them in a way that I otherwise can't, right? It's like that uh, Rilke line. Um, uh, 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 well, is it is it Rilke or is it Rilke filtered through uh, Woody Allen's Another Woman? Uh, because uh, uh, Jenna Rowlands' character uh, said when she confronted her, her life in that movie um, that uh, Rilke said that, uh, you know, I spent so much time like living, you know, in my art, you know, because I could not live in my life, right? Um, uh, Berryman, you know, uh, uh, kind of like attacking himself. Let's, if we want to do the crude biographical reading, um, uh, but but also, you know, attacking himself was his, his like, let's, you know, let's call it misogyny, sexism, whatever. Um, but also, you know, championing women by like giving them, you know, a nuanced kind of you know, appearances in his works, like, you know, that, that, that's a way to find redemption. It's like, well, fuck it. Like if I can't be a good person day to day, if I just can't bring myself to do that, um, at least I have the, these like sets of documents that show that, you know what, people like Henry are not really people to champion. Right. And, and, and they could have this kind of twilight, you know, set of dream songs, but this is not to, celebrate henry this is to celebrate the thing that comes from henry right if it's properly fashioned by an artist um so like you could read this as a kind of redemption kind of narrative um uh, in the hardest strange which includes the brash street as Berryman called it daniel swift's introduction helpfully points out that quote Berryman has not been canonized quite he has not continued to receive the respect, even awe, accorded to his great contemporaries, Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Bishop. Um, I, I haven't read these in a while, but I actually tried reading some Robert Lowell recently, and uh, it was honestly kind of boring, a lot of the poems that I read. And Elizabeth Bishop, we're actually going to talk about Elizabeth Bishop in a bit. Uh, we're going to evaluate one of her poems, and uh, I, I think uh, overall, um, uh, I'd say that uh, John Berryman had greater work Right, just by dream songs alone, than than either of these two. Um, from my memory, again, I haven't read these in full in a while. But recently, I was like, let me read some more confessional uh, poets for this thing. And honestly, there was nothing from Robert Lowell that I read that I even wanted to like talk about. Um, sorry, uh, uh, Swift less helpfully goes on to suppose this may be because he appears a little less serious than they do. The opposite is true. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you could fucking read this and say he's not. See, Berryman is too serious to be taught lightly. He's too racy. How many white teachers out there at any level are courageous enough to take on in a public forum a representation of the minstrel show? Not many would be my guess. Much easier to turn to Lowell. Well, I'm, I'm fucking. whose best-known poem takes as a central image a family of skunks, or safer to talk in class about the personification of the fish in Bishop's poem, The Fish. While Berryman, the bearded suicidal bastard, tangles with the black death minstrel, Lowell and Bishop seem almost disnified. I, 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 I think this is probably too harsh for them. 
I, I think overall there is something anemic about Robert Lowell, a little bit gutless, a little bit um, bloodless. You know, maybe he's more like generic poems, I guess. Um, but, uh, is Elizabeth Bishop Disneyfied? Well, um, this strike this strikes me as too as, 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 as too too much. But you know, at the same time, like I, I do agree with uh, the broader point that um, Berryman has. You know, like it's 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 it's, it's dream songs are a rough read. There are things that you know they're difficult to understand. They are difficult to follow. They're hard. They're tough. The lines are difficult, right? Elizabeth Bishop is an easier poet to read than you know a, a, a random smattering of dream songs. That's that's just true. Barryman, who has no best known single poem, is dead serious by comparison. Despite his hamming, Barryman is willing to meet racism, his own, his nation's blackface first, and to compare it to death. Berryman makes Lowell look safe. He also makes Lowell look sane. And Bishop, too, who seems guarded by comparison, her confessions kept largely in the closet. Um, far more than stiff Lowell and circumspect Bishop, outrageous Berryman is aligned with the age to come, which is not to say that Berryman is the poet for the coming age, but it may be to say that Berryman is more a poet for the ages. For evidence, see how many musicians have sampled the dream songs for lyrics among them, Nick Haven, McGordon, the, the, the fish basis. Yeah, I, I agree that John Berryman will be seen as more singular than either Bishop or Robert Lowell. Um, Berryman is ugly. Berryman's never easy. His poems, and, and that would be the case even if, like, you know, uh, they had more great poems. I think the oddness of Berryman, like, it's just, you know, there's just, there's just kind of like, there's honestly nothing like it. Berryman is ugly. Berryman's never easy. His poems are an expression of the split modern sensibility. This makes them harder to bear and at times impossible to read. What, like, what, what's the point of these, like, like hysterical <clears throat> overstatements? But who beats Berryman for a wider array of emotions, from clowning hysterical to empathy for a mass murderer and for a greater range of diction, the high-low of black and southern dialect, running to the droning and boring intonations of the damn poet. This is true. This is why he's so uh, special. Um, yeah, I'm not going to read the rest, but yeah, th that's the kind of idea uh, behind the blackface, right? So uh, it seems like um, th th this article, right? Uh, it, it, it seems like um, uh, Nick Corvo does sort of concede that there is racism in Berryman and like it's a racism that Berryman has to wrestle with and it's like emanating from and it's like being put down in the book itself. And again, I don't see that. I don't see anything about this character that would be considered uh, racist in the sense of, of, the, of the classic minstrel show, of the classic blackface, of the classic let's just turn black people into clowns. Um, the exact opposite is happening. And on some level, he's kind of you know, Nick Corvo is kind of accepting that. So I don't exactly uh, uh, understand where the personal racism is coming. Okay, okay, maybe, maybe again, Nick Corvo has, has a, a, an insight into Berryman's personal life that I don't, um, which is making him say that. But even if he has an insight into his personal life, and even if it's true, even if Berryman like constantly used the N-word like, you know, every day of his life, and, and we have like documented evidence of this, and he had like hyper-conservative views about, you know, black people. Even if all that is true, you still can't make the case that in the universe of the book, that the uh, character that keeps saying Mr. Bones, Mr. Bones, you can't make a case based on evidence from the book that there is racism there, right? You just can't. It, like it just doesn't appear. This, that, you know, so you know that's that you know that's a uh, like it, it's it's it, it's like I I find this like wh why is that concession made then, like. If, if we are even conceding that Berryman is personally racist because like he has things in his personal life that would suggest this, how are we able to concede that point on the artistic scale when we talk about the book? Because the book just does not support this contention at all. It just doesn't, right? The character that keeps saying Mr. Bones is there to show Henry up as like, the generic white person with generic problems. Like I'm sure Barryman understood 
you know, the, 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 the like, if we want to give this biographical reading, if we want to bring that, that back into it, I'm sure Berman understood how fucking cl- cliched and trite his problems were. You know, uh, an alcoholic uh, at the height of his, like, artistic powers, essentially given everything by the world, right? At that point, at least, and still not being able, right, to, to you know, you could call it love yourself. You could call it, like, uh, you know, I don't want to, like, more, I don't want to, I don't want to say things like he doesn't re- respect himself. You know, maybe you technically can, but, you know, uh, there is some kind of lack there that, you know, f- allows you to just continue being an addict of some sort. And I say this because, look, you know, I had addictions before in my past, right? Um, uh, I used to be morbidly obese uh, until the time I was uh, maybe like 19, 20 years old. And, uh, you know, pe- people always talk about like, you know, eating disorders when it comes to, you um, uh, like, you know, like girls like starving themselves because they're anorexic or bulimic and dying from that. Cause you know, that's like the extreme form that leads like in higher numbers, uh, I guess, to, uh, that kind of explicit death. Um, but you know, eating disorders, like mostly in America run the other direction. Like anybody that's overweight or obese usually has an eating disorder. Uh, food is comforting. Food is nice. Um, food is, uh, uh, food is good. My solution for my eating disorder was not to like starve myself or to like, well, I did starve myself for like months, right? Which is how I lost the majority of my weight before I, you know, started like, you know, exercising and learning how to cook. So it's been like, it's been like a, a an over a decade process at this point. Um, but I, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I, you know, uh, my, my way to deal with that is like, listen, uh, I can't be a fucking child anymore when I eat, like when I, when I have cereal, like I can't like have cereal late at night, like, 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 you know, tricks cereal with like, you know, milk and added sugar, or, like whatever, like I can't do that. So my solution is to listen, if I really like feel like having like late night cereal, um, let me, let me, uh, Fill a healthy cereal up that I would get from like Trader Joe's or whatever. Fill it up with like soy milk or whatever um, and have that. And it's okay. It's like whole grains. It's like very limited sugar. Maybe I put like fresh berries in there. So, you know, it's not the best thing to have needlessly in the middle of the night. But you know what? I could ha- I could feed into my personal addiction, which is still there, which is never going to go away, right? That feeling, that desire, Right, that craving is always there, and it you know it's a defense mechanism. It's like you know it's it's a means of feeling protected. It's a means of being satisfied. It's a means of you know if you if you're somebody that feels like the world is never enough, nothing can ever be enough. Like uh, uh, defense can never be enough, people can never be enough, relationships can never be enough, money can never be enough, nothing can ever be enough, food can never be enough. Right, you have that thing that grinds at you forever. So you either deal with it in a way that destroys you. Or you deal with it in a way that is able to sublimate some of this into like more more healthy kind of outcomes. So my solution is you could still gorge yourself every once in a while, Alex, but here's the deal. Every time you gorge and every time that you cook, uh, you have to make it healthy. So these are the problems of generic white people, right? As a white person, my problems usually revolve around am I going to eat like, you know, this piece of candy needlessly? For Berryman, his problem was, you know, I'm a great artist, but I'm also an alcoholic. And I there's just something missing, right? There's there's something about me that doesn't allow me to kick this habit forever. I just keep going back. I'm sure he understood how fucking trite that is, right? That's a trite problem to be in. It just is. We can and ought to be empathetic about this. Um, it's a difficult problem. Like we can't just like flippantly say like, oh, you know too weak, right? Too weak to deal with this. Let's just, you know, you know, take a shit on his life. Like we can't and shouldn't do stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I want to be empathetic. I want to be a quote unquote good liberal about this kind of stuff. I, to the extent that I have bourgeois liberal values that I value, they would play out in this way. And I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be mean about something like this, but I'm positive Behrman understood this about him. This is his generic white problem, right? Um, so, so, yeah, so let's just let's just read this uh, abstract um, uh, just to get a sense of some of the arguments. Again, I'm sorry if this does not uh, get at the arguments of Peter Maber, a hundred percent. If he says something more complex, but you know, my assumption is 
he wrote the abstract. My assumption is he did as good of a job as he could, just sort of outlining his argument in this abstract. So, or or this piece of the abstract. So let's see what we have so far. Okay. Um. John Berryman's decision to have his main character Henry in the Dream Songs performed sometimes in blackface came as a shock. Not only did the inclusion of dialect radically unsettle his once conservative literary voice, but there was a liberal intellectual in the 1960s apparently reverting to the crudest racial stereotyping of the past. Um, again, not so sure about that. I'd be mean, like, because here's the like, on its face of it, clearly that's not what's happening. If you read like just three fucking of these poems, like it's literally not happening. So apparently, apparently the opposite is happening, right? So we should say apparently he's not reverting to the crudest racial stereotyping of the past. But I think what he means to say is the perception was that this was going on. Apparently this is what he's doing. Um, and by the way, this is from 2008. So like the, these kinds of culture wars really like started amping up in the early 90s um and you know already they were like around in academia even though they didn't go mainstream until you know the 2010s the, the past decade not only did the um sorry uh, here was a character appearing to black up in the minstrel tradition to become mr bones are we talking about henry performing minstrel z skits with his fellow and and man oh yeah he, he's talking uh, he's talking about uh, henry and speaking in a dialect that approximated the offensive invention of white racists white racists well to the extent that a dialect exists like you you would say that by definition like any black dialect would be an approximation of an offensive invention right um just by using the dialect you just would so you just have to wonder like well if that's indistinguishable from racist versus non-racist who might use this for other purposes you know what exactly is the value of this distinction right i, I would ask that question intellectually i would ask people to really conceptually tease that out because you probably won't get a good answer about that early responses to the poem were mostly so confused that the shock was somewhat mitigated by the general sense of disorientation as critics began to unpick the song's many level influences the minstrel z elements began to be examined in more detail and uncertainty over how to react to them gave way to the sense of a need to account for them and urge to explain a way that, has, that, that has led to the traduction of their actual content and their function. So, uh, like, by the way, if, if I did this, right, if, if I merely engaged in an urge to explain away the blackface, and if I did something that led to the traduction of their actual content and their function, like please point that out, you know, either now in the live chat or in comments later if you read this, uh, if you view this after the fact. Because I don't think that I did that. I don't think I explained it away at all, right? Um, surveying the whole body of criticism today, it becomes clear that little perspective has ever been gained from, on this problematic mode. There is an urgent need for a reassessment and indeed a reorientation of this perplexed and uncompromising uncom aspect of one of the mid-20th century's most important poems. Despite their very interpretations, the discussions of the Dream Song's blackface are almost invariably framed in terms of an argument about legitimacy. Most critics seemingly embarrassed by this anachronistic usage, coterminous with the civil rights movement, have sought to justify the move. Again, we don't have to like just talk about justifying it as weird. Right? I mean, what are you justifying? Kathy Davis, despite going further than most in analyzing the constitution and function of dialect, epitomizes this tendency to plead exculpation on Berryman's behalf. She concedes that, quote, Berryman's use of blackface dialect may seem questionable if that, li if that literary and stage tradition is seen to represent a history of white expropriation, uh, but insists that, quote, Berryman made it clear that he meant the dialect to express himself as, quote, imaginary Negro. Going beyond mere sympathy, uh, sympathy to an imaginative identification with oppressed peoples. Well, I mean, whether or not Berryman says it, I don't see any evidence of like anybody being oppressed here. You have self-inflicted problems on the one hand, then you have a character in blackface pointing these problems out. Right? I mean, literally, like I don't see, like like who like who, who is seeing anything else? Like, what am I missing here? The difficulties with these sorts of claims are multiple. Berryman's intentions may differ from what he actually achieves. Well, yes, this is true. And this is why I'm perfectly capable, like willing to like uh, say like, yeah, his intention was just to be like a complete piece of shit racism only, a racist only. Because I'm still confident that it does not matter for the artwork. Furthermore, 
The phrasing of blackface dialects connotations as a choice needs qualification. Whilst, uh, whilst its entire history and usage are bound up with competing white impulses, love and theft as Eric Lott has it, it's consistent uh, raison d'etre, right? I know that's a bad pronunciation, sorry. I'm not gonna, I, I'm bad enough pronouncing uh, English words. And both minstrel shows and in dialect literature has always been one of white control. So, I mean, okay, so clearly as a white poet, John Berryman is like by definition going to control everything. To introduce, you know, a blackface character or anything other than a blackface character, it is still going to be, you know, uh, well, I mean, it's dynamic because it's poetry, but it's static in the sense that this is still going to be white control, right? I mean, it would if this if this is the argument that we're making. If we, if we're comfortable doing this reduction this early on in the argument, we have to concede that we could do this reduction everywhere else in the argument, right? And make it applicable to so many other things. And uh, personally, I, I think you'd get too many problems very quickly, right? To 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 make that sustainable. Um, Davis's final rejoinder is to echo the earliest critics of the songs and indeed Berryman's source Carl Whitkey uh, remarking that quote the original Jim Crow was not a white imitation but a crippled black man why, why do we have to get into this weird fuck like why do we have to do this to like analyze and explain the dream songs even on like two or three levels we don't have to do this who who Who's pigeonholing themselves into saying, oh, uh, uh, I'm not comfortable with the blackface and the dream song. So I'm going to quote, the original Jim Crow was not a white imitation, but a crippled black man. Do we need to do that? Is that honestly our life? It's not my life. From the varying accounts and historical mythologizing of the Jim Crow story, however, it is impossible to speak with any certainty about the origins of the minstrel acts. And in dedicating the second dream song to, to Thomas Dartmouth, a Daddy Rice, Berryman makes it clear that such representations of black behavior are viewed through the filter of white performance. The whole question of authenticity lying at the heart of this debate is far from clear cut. Some responses to this mid 20th century poetic incorporation uncannily echo the responses of writers to the antebellum minstrel show. So the argument thus far, as you know, as, as produced, is the kinds of justifications that we've seen of, of uh, the, the blackface, uh, they're the kind of white justifications of uh, antebellum, uh, you know, uh, minstrel shows. Um, so uh, at least uh, just kind of analytically, we haven't really moved on. And th this may be the case, but um, I think so far, like if I were writing this abstract, I would say about like the, the quotes that I picked out from others to kind of like, you know, poke fun of them. I would say like, well, I mean, who... Like who, like who gives a shit about that, right? Like that's not, that's not relevant, um, right? I wouldn't try to be arguing on their turf. It, it just seems kind of silly to me. Like, like okay, so you're gonna argue that, that with this on the turf? The er, the original Jim Crow was not a white imitation, but a crippled black man. I mean, why? Like why? Like what are you gonna get from that? You're not gonna get shit from that. You're gonna what placate? You're like fucking like liberal white liberal guilt for enjoying the dream songs knowing that it's a racist poem why are you doing this who's doing that <clears throat> okay so the argument is this is now sounds like uh uh you know antebellum justifications for racism so uh, and to give examples of this uh jm linebarger for instance concludes that quote Berryman admires Negroes for their creation of a dialect. I mean, literally everybody has a dialect, any ethnic group. What do you mean by, uh, I, I mean, is that, uh, what, what, is that like from the biography? Is, are these like biographical inklings and sketches? Or is this like somebody assuming that Berryman admires Negroes for their creation of a dialect? Every every fucking group on some level is gonna have a dialect. The more and the more that they're segregated, the more that they're like fucking like processed into like, you know, uh, an outside economy, an outside legal system, an extra fucking judicial legal system where they get like mowed down the street by by the state. Um, 
that group, sorry, sorry to break into people, that group is going to have a dialect. They just will, right? Because their entire like life context is so fucking different. You have no choice but to de- develop a dialect. To say that you admire any people for that is just... Um, and William uh, Wasserstrom, one of the first critics to detect the, to detect the importance of the minstrel elements, nonetheless betrayed the confusion of the early commentators on blackface minstrelsy when he referred to Berriman's, quote, undisguised importation of negritude that is, quote, drawn straight from the heart of misery incarnate. Um, Wasserstrom apparently conflates black and blackface and equates sorrowful expression with black expression. This ostensible diagnosis, in fact, raises so many more questions than it answers. Is negritude something which can be said to be imported, or rather, as an inherent quality? What has since been termed, quote, the essential black subject? Quote, uh, is it not, in fact, in direct opposition to supposedly transferable racial qualities, the concept having developed in the 30s? Okay, and then it ends off at that. Um... They're saying that it raises so many more questions than it answers. Uh, is negritude something which can be said to be imported or is it inherent quality? Well, obviously, with the way that this has functioned culturally and to the present day, both in you know criticism, culture wars, whatever, um, uh, everything in between, clearly the historical thing that we call negritude as it existed in literature uh, clearly can be imported conceptually and it also is an inherent quality. As, as it was treated, right? Not even that it's necessarily so, but I mean, so far, like with this minstrelsy stuff, like we're talking so much about like perception and we're, we're passing off a lot of these perceptions as facts. So, you know, uh, uh, to my mind, uh, given the context of what we're discussing, it doesn't even seem to matter all that much that, you know, negritude could be one or the other, right? Um, so like this, you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if, the, if this study is actually good or if it gets better, but... I, I, you know, to the extent that I can criticize an abstract that I haven't even fully read, I can say that thus far, I would not write this abstract and this, and this thing about blackface just in this way. I mean, to just like, you know, uh, uh, sum all of this up, every time we have blackface here, Henry is getting one-upped. The wisdom does come from Henry, yes, but it also comes from the character in blackface. Um, to the extent that we think of someone's race, right? The, like it, it is true, like we think of an other. But you know, a lot of this other is 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 as simple as, you know, the, 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 this, the, this character in blackface, right? right? that keeps saying Mr. Bones. Um, He's an other in the sense that uh, he is this kind of like you know, he, he's given a color, I guess, but in other ways he's this kind of like amorphous force, right? Because I mean, he's able to constantly cut Henry down. He's constantly able to get reality out of Henry that Henry would otherwise want to, you know, sort of you know keep in. Um, uh, he 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 fulfills this kind of like other function of like the, this you know this 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 force that Henry can't truly contend contend with. But you know, I think to the extent that it's racialized, to the extent that we do think and imagine a black person. I mean, I, I imagine a black person uh, or like a person in a black face, perhaps sometimes, and I imagine both. Like talking to to Henry like throughout the dream songs. This is true. But to the extent that I do that, you know, I'm just imagining just like, you know, Berryman is imagining his readers would, you know, someone that doesn't look like me, uh, some kind of other, right? Um, uh, and, and and this this otherness is accentuated by, you know, an above average, you know, store of wisdom, an above average store of like personal poesy and poetry, an above average like sense for reality, right? An above average way of, you know, pushing the buttons of someone that is, you know, in many ways to have the poems like deluding himself until he gets those like moments of clarity. Um th- 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 this the, uh, it, it, so 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 like the otherness there, like it, it's useful in the sense that like in Berriman's time and for a long time before and for like a long time thereafter, still today, we're still thinking of like black people as an other. Like, um, you know, uh, uh, to the extent that I think of myself as a white person, 
I externalize black people from like, you know, this society in that regard for my, you know, you know like Henry has this like, you know, a uh, uh, sense of, um, you know, I, I view the world through this kind of like solipsistic lens, right? And to the extent that all white people or all people do, like, you know, black people do that to some degree, you know, uh, we, we always like, you know, do this kind of other, you know, this is a good you know, uh, a way of not only doing it by shortcut, like you're immediately getting people to have this like other image. Like it's just, especially like in the 60s and 70s, you would, you would, you would, you would quickly have that in your head. Like it would pop into your head right away. Um, so you have that part. The other part of it is like, you have a way to deal with like Henry as a character, right? Like by doing this like different kind of dialect, first of all, like you're counterbalancing this like, you know, I don't want to call Henry clean cut because he's not, but he's like, you know, this like upper class in some ways educated, poetic, you know, uh, type character. Um, uh, and you're able to do the, this kind of balancing act, right? And, and you know, you othered this other character, you othered his level of, uh, of wisdom, you othered his race, but um, you, you did that for like the imagistic purposes. You did that to immediately get, you know, the brain to be thinking about this stuff. But you know, I, I don't think it's true. I just don't think it's true that you think about racism all that much when you think about the dream songs. I just don't see it. I personally don't. Um, I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, anyway, so uh, honestly, I, I'm going to just, just take some comments and the stream here. On Monday, I was thinking whether or not to do Monday, but since I'm I'm not getting to some of the other stuff I wanted to, to uh, discuss, like I want to discuss poems by... Um, uh, 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 Elizabeth Bishop, who was also in this kind of like confessional school of poetry. I wanted to discuss uh, actually a villanelle by Elizabeth Bishop called um, uh, The Art, uh, One Art, right? The Art of Losing is Not Hard to Master is how the villanelle begins. I'm going to compare it to Jessica, Jessica Schneider's, I think, better villanelle uh, called Moth Loss in a Laboratory. So I'll do that next time. So we're going to compare a confessional with a modern. Um, we're going to talk about another form of confessional poetry uh, uh, through like, you know, Bukowski. I don't think classically, like I said last time, is put into the confessional poetry or confessional writing kind of category. But I mean, he sort of like hits all the fucking notes, except he was less talented I guess, than, than the best uh, confessionalist. Um, uh, but we're going to talk about some some of the some better and some worse poems by, by Charles Bukowski. So I'm excited about that. Um, and I'm just going to take some comments and we're going to end this stream. We're going to do a stream. Maybe Monday it's going to be like earlier. Maybe I'm going to start actually my vacation uh, uh, early and um, uh, not do... Uh, Monday evening, who knows what kind of crazy shit I'll, I'll, I'll come up with by the time Monday comes around. Um, let's just see if anybody has anything. By the way, if anybody's watching this right now, if you're a new person, if you haven't uh, subscribed, if you're just like a random straggler, like just go back into this stream a little bit, see the kinds of stuff that I talk about. Um, honestly, like, you know, I, I, I think I'm providing something of, of value to people. Uh, I hope that you agree. I hope that you'd want to subscribe. I hope that you could like this video now before we sign off for the night. Um, let me just see if there's any comments and if there are, I'll take them. <laughs>